My name is Richard Lee. I am a certified master gardener. Uh, this year I'm currently serving as the association's pre vice president. Uh, I've worked out South Branch Nursery, if any of you know where that is, down there on uh, 231 in North Shovel. I've been in there with them for seven years now. Grew up with my grandparents, helped my grandfather with his vegetable garden, helped my grandmother with flower beds, and working out all the issues in between. Because my grandfather had made vegetables he could grow, he could fit grow a flower to save his soul. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about fall and winter vegetable gardening. What is fall gardening? It's one of those things that kind of sounds like it might be complicated, but it really isn't. It's simply just a way to extend your harvest season, get the most thing out of Tennessee's gardening bug. Because we do have really great growing seasons here. We have a spring growing season, we have a summer growing season, which everyone's familiar with, that's what we're doing right now. Then we have a fall growing season because Tennessee has a nice mild climate so we can do stuff quite well in the winter. And then thanks to the way our winters sometimes fall out, you can even take and grow a lot of things straight through until February where you pick up spring gardening again. Uh, lots of uh, really strong leaf greens will make it really easily all the way through cold months, especially if you have them in the cold spring. Uh, you can even take and avoid the worst of the frost with some vegetables by doing some of these techniques. So there's lots of opportunity to take and apply these things other than just planting stuff out for the fall. Um, staggered succession planting is a way to really make good use of your space. You can use this time to take and keep iterating that on out. Many plants have maturity rates so they'll pop them in and ready right about the time the frost hits or just a little ways afterwards. So you can just kind of keep that growing right along. Uh, just pulling something out, putting something in there that'll have about the same growing time. And it's also a good way to enjoy your garden without having to worry about heat. No one likes working in the garden in 90 degree weather. This time of year my business gets real slow for that exact reason. And then all those of us who are at the business get real slow for that exact reason. We don't do a lot of work whenever it gets hot, even though we probably should be. So why do you want to do a fall garden? You can extend your growing season, we already talked about. Get some fresh vegetables, even whenever it starts getting cold or it is cold outside. One fellow with the association uh, a couple of years ago was pulling kale straight through the coldest winter months we had. Some things do grow a lot better in the fall garden. Um, who all here has ever tried growing uh, green peas and sweet peas? Those things do their absolute best whenever it's cool. The problem is, is that around here sometimes you can't get them out into the ground until we're about a month away from the heat in the spring. But you can start them in the house for the fall, plant them out in September, and then you've got several months to be pulling uh, pods off of them before the frost will find them and freezes really will finally kill them. you got fewer pest disease issues. By this time of the year, only the hardiest and toughest of the bugs are still hanging around and causing trouble. Most of them have already started in to the, to the early maturity phases of their life, so they finish laying eggs usually, or they're just starting to kind of move around to get ready for next year. They won't be too much of a trouble for your gardens. So you can avoid a lot of those. More rain and cooler temperatures as you plant instead of the opposite. As we go through September and October, we start getting more and more rain. Things start getting a little bit more livable for everybody, including the plants. Whereas in the summer, you saw this June, we picked up right nice and fast into the heat right after it takes forever to finally get them up. It's easy to be outside. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> it gets really, really hot around here. And you find that with humidity, gardening can become a really miserable thing to do. So any chance you've got to work on it where you can be comfortable with it is a godsend and a blessing. Because it's a great hobby. You don't want to have to be ruined with heat stroke. And some plants taste better with a little bit of chilly air. Um, anyone here like Brussels sprouts? Brussels sprouts always taste better once they get the frost. Um, they just have a lot better flavor too once they've gotten chilled. Some plants can serve as cover crops for the winter. If you're not familiar with this concept, a cover crop is anything that you plant to hold the soil in place and protect the ground during the off-season months. There's some things you can plant out that you can eat that serve that purpose. Turnips, you can take and pull the green some for a while and you can actually pull the turnips themselves. They make a good cover crop. Um, 
arugula, brassica, which is a nice little uh, leaf vegetable. The list kind of goes on and on. Almost anything will just hold the soul there. You can do spinach, is a remarkably good one. We've got a slide in here. Got, I have to finally put it in here at some point from our two winters ago. We had a plot of spinach out there in the demo beds. February, coldest winter since I was a kid. That stuff was still pushing out new leaves. And they were really, really nice and good looking. So, what are some of the problems with the fall garden? Well, Compressed spring and summer varieties don't always grow well going into the fall months. Those plants are usually meant to kind of pick up the pace a little bit slower. They're in there for the long haul, sometimes they're a little bit more drought tolerant, which is a good thing. But they're not always the best thing to put in the ground for trying to get a quick turnaround in the fall. We usually want stuff that's going to have a shorter germination and maturity span because the quicker it can get to where you need it to be, the faster you're going to be able to pick vegetables off of it. You do have to pay some more attention. There is some other issues in the fall, like sudden freezes. Uh, occasionally, we will get a spur of the moment drought at the end of the year, where we just don't have a lot of rain when we're supposed to. Every once in a while, we'll decide to have snow on Halloween. That's happened more than a few times. Uh, sometimes you get a little bit of pest invasion late in the year because they've been harboring somewhere else. It, more just the timing of everything too because you want to make sure you're hitting that frost date for the plants at the right maturity level. Mentioned the unexpected heat and drought. You can only do so much work in the fall with your ground and you're already planting in it. Fall also unfortunately and fortunately tends to be the best time to amend your soil for your garden beds. You want to be working in as much stuff as you can that time of year because that gives you the entire winter for Mother Nature to do the tilling work for you. She'll take it uh, with the freeze and the and drive all those nutrients down good in the soil and start breaking stuff up. But if you've got a big patch of kale and cabbage and a few rutabaga and maybe some beets all sitting there in that garden plot, you really can't do too much work with it that you normally would. And there are still some pests that you have to worry about in the fall. Aphids are always a problem no matter what time of year you're in. So honestly, the bugs will always be with us, and you can't get a fall garden. So, who can grow a fall garden? This is my favorite answer. Absolutely anybody can grow a fall garden because everything gets easier the longer you go into the season once you get started. You can even grow them in a pot on the back porch. It really doesn't take a lot of work to do. Just anywhere you can take and pull, we get cool nights. It's really, really fun to take and try and put them all out there in the yard. I mean, this right here looks very simple, but that's onions and carrots. It's a good, simple bed. Those plants will take and last you well through the frost. The onions will be a little bit tougher than the carrots. Are. The carrots, you can keep them safe, but if it goes to get too cold, throw in a little straw with the tops. Around here, it takes us well until December before we get a frost hard enough to kill stuff that's actually in the by in the ground, I mean below the soil. So root crops are really, really good for fall garden. So where do you plant? Nice a picture up there at the top. Break through the stuff this summer. Take put in your beds and boxes. Take in this summer crops get spent, replace them. Get ready to take and do some more stuff in the fall. Do that succession planting we were talking about. In unexplored microclimates. Microclimate is a place that its temperature variance and its humidity is a little bit different from the surrounding area. One of my favorite two places for that is near your uh, dryer vent at the house because you've always got a little extra heat coming out right there. They'll keep the frost off a little bit more. Uh, good strong brick walls that have a south, south-ish facing. That'll always take and hold a lot more heat. They'll take and slowly release that throughout the night, keep that frost in the hole and push it back. You can mimic that by placing stones in areas. Uh, if you have a spot underneath a real thick tree, they'll keep the frost from settling as heavily. Um, and that's one thing about fall gardening too. You can get away with planting a lot more stuff in the shade because as they start growing, the trees start losing more leaves. So you get more and more light as things go through. You still get some of the protection from the branches. Um, somewhere that's close to the kitchen. It's always important to put your garden 
near where you eat because if you're like me, by the time you get home after an eight to 10 hour day, you don't want to trick the 100 yards out to the garden bed. You would much rather you take your walk by the front and sit next to the porch and pick your uh, carrots out of the window house. And whenever it gets cold and there's snow on the ground, you really don't want to be doing that yards because you might trip, you might fall, it's going to be cold. Fall garden, but you plant it now, you can start planting all sorts of stuff right now with the fall garden. Uh, some things have to go ahead and start as transplants for the fall. Those peas I was talking about, within the next few weeks, you want to get them going. If you're planning on doing any broccoli for the fall, you can take and get it started in the house now and move it out later in the summer, early fall. As it usually takes about six weeks to get seeds started into a transplant size. You can take and again, fall gardening really isn't always about just planting stuff that'll grow good in the cold. It's also about keeping that season going throughout the end of the year. I've got some stuff up here that I'll hand out at the end of class that makes for good late season plantings. You've got some basil you can keep going for a while. There's a few peppers that at a garden store they run the course, but you can take them and plant in the house to get a late season run of peppers off of them. Same thing goes for tomato plants. Well, plantings depend on the variety of time and maturity. That's going to be your big uh, limiters, how fast it matures and how tough it is to cold and frost. So always be selective in what uh, cultivars you're getting. So what's the cutoff date? Around here, the cutoff date is always going to be your average first frost. That's October 14th. I put that up there because that's my anniversary. It makes life really easy. <laughs> Uh, I get two dates for one price. You can't get any better. Um, average first frost is always going to be the first time the air temp is at or below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the opportune time for the cold to settle enough to start freezing moisture on plants. And that frost for some plants is a bad thing. They can handle fine. Other plants, even a light frost, will take them below every cell on the leaves and they'll wilt and then they're done. Tomato plants are an excellent example of that. Once they get a, even a nice slick of frost on them, they're finished for the rest of the year. You can usually pick the tomatoes off of them, let them go ahead and ripen inside the house. Sometimes they're not as good tasting as they could be because they haven't shoved enough sugars into them. Uh, sometimes that frost can damage the fruit if it's not well protected. Uh, so again, paying attention, that little extra, extra bit of uh, time spent is really important to kind of judge where everything sits. And then how do you plan your planting dates? This is the fun one. This is going to be a slide that will probably scare most of you. It terrifies me every time I look at them. So it's very convoluted, but it's not really all that difficult. You start with your average date in the first frost, which we said was October 14th. Technically, it's October 15th. Um, you determine if your plant you're growing to take a live freeze before harvest. Most of the stuff will want to grow for a long hand. Then you'll adjust the starting date by a couple of, by a week or two. Uh, usually it's better to give them a little bit more time than a little less. So about uh, 10 to 14 days is usually pretty good. Uh, most seed packets estimate the diet phase of uh, seed on a regular packet of beans. It usually winds up being about 60 days. Um, so you have to kind of pack that into that. Um, there's that 10 days because of uh, cooler or shorter days in the fall. You want to make sure you're counting for that light change. You're providing enough time to kind of run their course the way they're supposed to. And then subtract the total number of days required from the average frost date. So you're going to be able to apply this simple. So here's the example. Our average frost date, 15. Days of maturity after planting is 15. That accounts for that uh, week span. Uh, we're going to add 10 days, so we're going to 60 days each. So we're going to take October 15th, subtract two months, and that gives us August 15th. So let's say this was a pack of beans. The last time we put those out and be able to ensure we'll get a harvest is August 15th. We put them out afterwards, kind of playing with your chances a little bit. If you put them out towards the very end of August, you're probably not getting things that don't have enough chance to grow before the cold hits them. So, how do you plan a fall garden? 
pretty much the same as you did your shot. You're going to make sure you pull a soil test if you need to. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you. Um, August 15th, for that example. And you said that's a transplant? Um, it depends on the cultivar. Some things you can set out then. Uh, other things you can set out a little bit later. Uh, things like broccoli, you need to set it in the ground probably mid end of August. Because those plants take a little bit longer can you time. Speak to up a little bit? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the broccoli, you want to set them out in mid August or the close to the end because those plants need a little extra time to settle into the ground better. Green peas, those plants sell out real fast and grow real quick once they start. So you put them out once it gets a little bit cooler. Um, it really kind of depends on the cultivar and your garden site because all those microclimate things I was talking about earlier, no matter where you have your garden, unless it's just flat in an open field, you're going to have some effects off of it. Uh, I have a little garden plot of the house. The north side of it is blocked by a building, so it doesn't get as much wind as it gets colder. And it stays a little bit frost free quite a bit longer. It's also got some big trees overhanging nearby. That helps out as well. Um, and the way it's positioned, it catches the very last light of the sun every day, so that knocks in a little extra heat. Uh, the trees in that calculation that you just gave us. Mm -hmm. That to, that to set out the plants, or is it completely? That, that's um, set out or seen. Um, because whenever you do your transplanting, that maturity rate is usually about the same thing. Because if you've ever gotten tomato plants like early girl in the, in the spring, those plants need about 65 to 70 days to mature, and that's from still being just planted out. Because at that point you're almost starting over again with their uh, maturity, with their growing cycle, because they're having to reroot and take advantage of everything. So all that tag information all there on the packing packet will still hold true. So you can just use that to plan out. Um, any other questions on that line on that subject? Did I explain it about like mud? Okay. Um, your soil test. Um, if you've never run a soil test, Extension offers soil testing. Um, it's twelve dollars now, I believe, for a test. Um, I wish Jane was in here; she could uh, correct me on that if I needed to. They did finally have to go up on it, but it's also now a more complete test. Used to be you'd only get nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium on there. Now you get a few micronutrients. They always give out recommendations based on what you told them you're wanting to do in the space. So if you told them you're going to grow a vegetable garden there, it'll take and tell you what you need to add to the soil as far as salt, as far as a, a nitrogen increaser, or if you need to add any lime, how much to apply to get the results you need to grow the stuff you want to there. Uh, follows the best time to take to pull your soil test because everything's had a chance to settle out all summer. You can take once you get those results back. It'll give you an opportunity to get things on the ground that can slowly affect the summer the soil all winter long before you get your spring, plant, spring planting. Um, you usually don't have to do that every single year. Every two to three years is fine unless you know you have an issue with the ground. Uh, if you have plants that are constantly yellowing out and you know it's not because of watering, you probably want to pull a soil test, have it checked, and then see what you need to add to the ground to make that situation resolved. Um, mulching. Mulching is really important as we go in fall because that gives a little extra protection for the roots of the plants in the soil. Mulch is always going to provide a little thermal protection. It's going to provide uh, protection from drying out. It's going to provide protection from some insects. It's also going to provide a little nutrient material going in. It can even give an extra place for plants to root out into. Uh, tomatoes will always take and try to root wherever they're making contact with something that is remotely resemble soil, so they'll try to shut out the roots through there. If you've ever heard about healing them up, that's what you're doing. They promote a little extra plant it twice as deep as they are big in the fall to account for the fact that a lot of them need cooler germination temperatures. Uh, 
probably my best example to give that will work well for everybody is if you've ever tried to put fescue seed out for a lawn, fescue germinates in like the 40s to high 60s. If you try to take and put it right across the top of the ground in the summer, it's not going to germinate, it's just going to burn. You have to get it about a half inch or so below the ground. Same thing goes for something like the coriander seed, which is cilantro. They're usually about a half inch to a quarter of an inch size. So you want to put them down to the ground about a half to three quarters of an inch. That way they can take and have the cool temperatures they need, have access to the moisture they have to have, and then they can start germinating. Nice simple little infographic here for you to take and deal with. So essentially just double the seed height and always make sure that the seed is pointing up. Some things make it real easy like pumpkins. They've got that nice little point at the tip. Um, you can usually see some spot on there where there's a little seam, where there's a little attachment point that can go down. Uh, in the case of things like uh, peas or beans, just to try to get them in there as best as you can. Those guys will usually write themselves. They're real good about it. Uh, prepare your garden or your pot, because let's not forget about the container garden. Uh, all of your dead and unproductive stuff out of those, out of that area first. You want to make sure you clean out anything that can have an issue because we don't want to be introducing new diseases or problems plants are or we're trying to get growing for later that we're having now. Uh, go ahead and throw them on the compost pile. They'll take and be ready for you to spread out, generally by the time we get to spring. Uh, you can even take and burn them, make some ash. Uh, we're also a really good way to get rid of the infested material. If you don't want to just throw it into the trash can and send it over to the landfill. Ash is an excellent way to take and deter some pests. It makes for a great amendment to your compost beds, and in very small amounts, it can be a good amendment for your ground to take and feed your plants with. You just don't want to overdo it. There's a reason why they call it salt and burning the earth. Um, and again, remove all insect and disease and pest material. Um, once you get all that done, add in any additional compost material that you're going to be doing with. Make sure you're feeding that ground because the healthier your ground is, the healthier your plants are going to be because you're only as good as the place you live at whenever it comes to plants. Oh, that is not the button I want. There we go. the soil if you use containers. Um, depending on what type of fertilizer you've, you've been using that year, you can build up some stuff in there that may not be great for plants. If you use a lot of uh, inorganic chemical fertilizers, especially liquid type stuff, you can build up a lot of salts in your soil. So you really want to start trying to soften those container beds out as often as you can, at least once a year, at least partially, to get rid of some of those excess salts. Um, if you're using just like compost tea, usually not a problem. Uh, there's some fun things like Monty's Joy Juice, uh, that entire line of products. He go, his company goes to extreme lengths to make sure that you don't have a lot of salts in your liquid fertilizer. So it's a pretty good product for that use. But always if you have compost, make you some compost tea. It'll be really, really good for your garden. If you're not having a fall garden, now it's time to go ahead and do that soil test again. Make sure to take and go ahead and mend your ground when you need to. Add any compost you want to for that next year. Uh, great time to go ahead and pre-plow the ground because it's a lot easier in the fall to take and plow the soil up than it is to try and do it in the spring. Um, we have really, really uh, unstable weather in the spring. Lots of rain is coming through and fairly frequently. And usually about the time your soil is good to till, we get another downpour. Whereas in the fall, in September, we're traditionally drier that month. The ground's got a decent amount of moisture to it. So it's much easier to run the tiller through there or the river, take and turn that ground over and get it ready for next year. Because it's already prepped, it's already got organic material in it. You'll be able to turn it that much faster the next spring because it'll already drain and dry it out before we get that next drunk of rain. So dealing with us, this is our big enemy for the fall. This is the thing we have to watch out for the most. If there's a frost warning, 
even if it's mild, which means no lesser than 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Try covering tender plants with pretty much anything you can find. Some good old fashioned options are burlap, uh, various sacks. I like pots because I have access to a ton of them. Floating row cover, I have a picture of that on the next slide. Pretty much anything that will take and cover them and keep that cold off of them, you can use. Do, however, make sure you pull them off before the sun gets all the way up the next morning. Because some of that stuff you leave it on there too long can take and burn the plants. Also, if it's a real heavy material that you're using to protect them, have something to give support to that material. That way it's not laying right on top of the plants because you don't want to break those stems or the leaves that you're going to try and eat. Uh, root crops such as carrots and radishes should be harvested and mulched heavily before a hard freeze. So either pull them out or just throw a good level of straw over the top of them to protect those green ones. When would you suggest mulching? Like Almost as soon as you start seeing green growth for <coughs> um, for anything you transplanted, once you put it in the ground, take and throw that mulch down at the top of it. Otherwise, if you need to add anything extra, just wait for that frost warning. Um, especially if it's going to go to a hard freeze, which is usually below 30 degrees. Around here, we normally don't have that problem though until we get past Thanksgiving, fortunately. It's the wonders of living in Tennessee. As I frequently tell people, we can grow absolutely everything you wanted to in one year and then also kill half of it. <laughs> um, don't panic upon the arrival of frost or freezes. We'll always get a warm spell afterwards. It never fails. We get cold and then we get warm again. Just like in spring, we get warm, then we get cold, and then we finally warm up again. Um, weather conditions will be milder. You can pull that last run of fruit. If you protected some more of the tender crops, you can they can finish harvesting them up and let them run their course. Tomatoes can be done this way. Um, just to protect them until you get a little bit more size to those tomato tomatoes, or they get a little bit redder before you pull them off the vine. When a killing frost is inevitable, harvest the most tender vegetables and then just get ready to throw the rest of the compost in. Uh, some other tricks in dealing with this is for tomato plants, if in mid-September you'll go through and top all of them, it'll generally force them to start throwing more sugar into the fruit instead of trying to keep them growing. And then you top them, so it'll cut off all the growing tips at the top of the plant. The light levels are starting to get low enough that they'll start throwing all the sugar they can into their fruit that they're putting on instead of throwing it into more leaf growth. Uh, wind up making everything ripen up a little bit faster. You can also take the opportunity to thin the plants a little bit, get some more light on that fruit. That way the sun helps speed that process up even more. Um, in the case of tomatoes and both tomatoes and peppers both, if it's a small enough plant, you can go out there with a digging fork, pop it in the ground next to them, lift them straight out of the soil, rinse the roots off some, wrap them in burlap or a wet paper towel, or a wet, wet newspaper, you go hang them in the garage. They'll keep growing for a little while afterwards as far as sending sugars through. Uh, the tomatoes you can pick at your leisure. You can let the peppers actually dry on the plants and then go pull them off as the next rainy day project you have before Thanksgiving. And then after that, you can start making pepper strings, strings which is what I got to do leading up to Thanksgiving. Uh, protecting your plants. Uh, here we have an example of a row cover. Uh, that's a floating row cover. That's just a very light material. It usually adjusts the temperature by just a few degrees, somewhere between two and five, depending on its quality. Um, those can actually be left on the plants because they don't trap a ton of heat and they also move very easily because they're light. <coughs> so they'll let some additional air through, especially if you don't have them tapped down too hard across the sides. Uh, they're one of the best things you take to put on plants as far as protecting them goes. They can even work as bug protection because you can leave them on there for so long through the seasons. Uh, cloches, this is a really cool thing. That's a glass one. Essentially what it is, it's a little bale, a little glass bale. And you take and you set it down over the plants. Some of them don't have an opening at the top. Others of them do. At night you go through and you drop a little cork in there. It's going to get real cold. Otherwise you can leave it open. And it allows trapping of heat in there and then release of that heat throughout the day so you don't have to worry about burning the plants. So once it gets a little colder, you can leave those on almost all the time. 
If you don't want to go out and buy a nice glass one, you can actually make one of these out of gallon milk jugs. Take and cut the bottom off, save the tops. You go set it down over top of your plant. If you need to secure it, a little tin stake with some string right next to it, it won't have to worry about blowing all over the yard. You have your plants protected. It's a really cool way to take and keep a leaf green safe for a protracted period of time. How long do you make that on the entire growing? Um, it just depends. Nor for some plants, it's till they get large enough that they have the hardiness to withstand lots of cold. Uh, kale, uh, cabbage, they can take several, several light to hard to mild freezes and frosts before they start suffering any damage. Uh, spinach, like in that example I told you about out earlier in the demo beds, those guys have been had been completely exposed all winter long and are still growing. The only thing that they had different from what would be in like an open plot garden was they had about four inches of bedside coming up over the edge. So they had a little protection from any excess wind that might dry them out. So it's just... those don't need it? Yeah, usually they don't once they're up. And uh, you've got at least a few pickings off of them already. They'll just kind of keep trucking along no matter what the cold is. Uh, of course, the last couple of winters we have been getting cold enough that it can freeze stuff out that normally doesn't. And that event, just kind of watch it play by ear. If we're going to go into several days where we're not getting outside of the teens or uh, high 20s, you might want to go out there and throw something in the middle of the day over top of them, like a cloches or a floating row cover. That'll give them some protection for that next evening. Uh, and then my personal favorite thing is cold frames. These things are awesome. Uh, the whole purpose of the cold frame is having an adjustable climate for whatever you're growing. You can make them out practically anything. Uh, usually they just simply consist of some sort of material around the edge to give support, then a few pieces of glass. They're generally slanted ever so slightly towards the south so they can patch as much sun as possible. Some of them will have a little riser in one of the corners or at the center bar where you can take and tick the windows up to adjust it depending on how much heat you're getting that day. They even sell a little actuator <coughs> with a temperature gauge that you can set up on that where it'll automatically do that. <coughs> I mean, there's tons of different ways to do them. This one's made out of straw bells and some uh, cheap uh, scrap lumber and just a single sheet of uh, greenhouse plastic. Uh, this one will... Uh, uh, plexiglass, one board to give some support across, more straw. This one's made out of a whole bunch of plexiglass and a frame. That one can just be set down over top of stuff and it's even inside of a raised bed already. You can take and adjust a raised bed make a mini hoop house out of it using some PVC pipe and some fittings and plastic. You can make a nice wood one and take and uh, have either that automatic or just a little lift or you have to go out there and like, oh, it's morning, lift it up, put it over the side, let it sit all day, and then that night before it gets dark, they go out there and drop it back down. They catch that last bit of sun before everything gets dark. Um, one trick you can do if it goes to get real cold or you've got something especially tender in there, take you a gallon of milk jug, paint that sucker as black as you can get it, fill it up with water, and set it in there. And do this three or four times. That uh, milk jug and that water will soak up a ton of heat, especially because it's painted black. It'll absorb all of it that it can, and then it'll slowly release it throughout the night. So you'll manage to avoid some of that cold. It gives you a little bit more of a buffer. Will that help? I mean, would that be enough to help fruit trees when we get the early frost in the spring? Um, always kill everything and end up with no fruit. It depends on the size of the tree. Yeah. For those, usually the best thing is to get a large enough sheet of uh, frost of a uh, row cloth that you can drape over it and get them up to where their size large enough to be above most of the cold. Unless we go to get just a deep freeze. And unfortunately, whenever you talk about that, susceptible plants like fruit trees, there's not much you can do. Because once those temperatures start dropping down below freezing, all except the hardy stuff, we're going to start losing uh, plant material. Uh, uh, there's really not a lot you can do. Things like figs, 
if you've got enough stones around the base of them, they'll at least keep the root system real healthy. They're a new wood produced, they're a new growth plant, so you'll still get your fruit off of them. But for traditional orchard trees, there's not really a whole bunch you can do. The two best things you can do to protect them from the cold is actually to make sure you plant them on a northeast slope. Uh, that northeast is important because that gets them out of the hottest sun that's available during the day. They stay a little bit cooler a little bit longer so they don't start pushing sap this soon, which hopefully gets them a little bit further along in the season before they start producing any flowers. Those so you don't have to worry about that late cold getting them. Having them on that hill, and it doesn't even have to be a steep hill, it can be a rise of just like a few inches with a small ditch nearby because the cold is going to take and settle and run towards that low area. So it takes and helps draw that off of there. Plus that wind movement keeps everything from being able to settle. So you don't have as much chance of a frost sitting on there either. It's a little thing, but it can make a big difference in a lot of cases. Uh, other best practices for fall. Uh, remember containers may be moved during the growing season. It's a lot easier to shift those around. If you have some stuff on the porch, they're calling for a frost. Just pick it up and bring it in the house, bring it up underneath the eave, bring it, bring it over into the uh, screened in porch, just anywhere out of the direct cold. Uh, you can even shift stuff over to get more sunlight during the day if it's something that might need a little, a little bit faster pick me up. Uh, plan the fall garden at the same time you plan the spring and summer garden. Lots of seed catalogs, lots of people who have seeds do not always have seeds in the fall. So you'll want to make sure you're going through and picking your varieties, pick out your packets for your spring and your summer gardens, and also pick out a packet or two or get your transplants planned to be ordered because some places do do that for the fall. Uh, the good news about going into the fall, we've got a nice warm period to start growing some stuff out really easily without all the shenanigans we have to get up into in the house normally with grow lights and heating beds and whatnot because it's already warmer. We can make use of the outdoors to get some of that stuff started a little bit faster, a little bit easier. Um, and it also helps if you're doing succession planning, doing that intensive gardening, that you have your plan for how many seeds you need to go through that whole period. One of the great things about gardening is we get about two and a half to three months to plan out the entire rest of the year because there's not really much else we can do with the garden. So the more you can plan your garden out, the more successful it will wind up being. And any good plan also then allows you some flexibility because you always want to try and plant a few different varieties of everything to keep everything successful. Include your seed needs for fall when ordering seeds for the spring and summer garden. Notice I repeated myself. That's how important it is. A direct seed is the best way to plant the fall garden because most of that stuff is a lot better rooting into the ground itself instead of having to be transplanted and rooting again because they can run those roots out further faster. Uh, there are a handful of exceptions. It's really, really hard to get broccoli to grow from seed in our weather normally. So you want to start it as transplants. Uh, some things don't like the heat as much like peas, well, green peas. So you have to put them out a little bit later so you won't have that normal growing time for them. So having them start in the house and moving them out is a little bit more successful. A thin organic mulch layer helps retain soil moisture and keep soil warm. So I'm, I'm talking about literally like a quarter to a half inch of really good ground up cold compost or humus just right across the top of the ground. It gives a little bit of a buffer, feeds them a little bit as they start growing. Uh, something else you can do if you have seeds that need really cool growing temperatures or a lot of moisture is you can lay a piece of cardboard over top of the seed bed. That will trap enough moisture underneath there and also keep it cool enough the seeds can germinate a little bit quicker because uh, seeds don't have to have light really to germinate. They only need that once they start putting on leaves. They've got enough energy in them to take and get between those two stages usually. Uh, that's why if you've ever had a uh, bean sprouts, they grow those in the dark all the time because you don't have to have light to get them going. Uh, tomatoes, which I don't have any up here, but I'll take this pepper here as an example. If you're going to put them in the garden in the fall, there is an awesome technique called trenching. 
Because normally by the time you get your pepper, your uh, tomatoes in the midsummer, they're about yay tall, have a few leaves on them, maybe just a nice little set up here at the top. And if y'all remember, I said tomato plants are taking root out wherever their stems touch something that resembles soil. So what you can do is dig a trench as long as they are tall, you pull them out of the pot, you lay them over. Make sure that this root section is underneath the soil, and you bend that tip up, and you can take, put your little stick next to it to hold it there. Cover all that up after you remove the leaves. So make sure you remove the leaves first. Cover that all up with soil, and then water them in real good. They will start rooting out like gangbusters real, real fast. I did this with some plants. I had a little bone mill too a few years ago with a friend. We had them go from about this tall right here to about this tall in the span of two weeks. Because they just put on roots that fast and they're that ready to go. That's tomatoes, not. That's tomatoes. Peppers, you can't bury, unfortunately. They don't uh, deal with that quite as well. Uh, you are going to tell us about pepper strands that you mentioned, though. Yes. Okay. Um, those are actually really, really simple to make since we're at this portion of the conversation. All you have to do to make a pepper string get you your pile of peppers, get you a needle, get you a couple of feet of thread. Okay? Usually you try to keep them about that long. So if you pull you about, what is that, a yard's worth of uh, thread, so three foot, fold it over, and you just pick up a pepper, you put the needle through the side, and you just repeat that, almost like making a popcorn uh, garland, until you fill up the whole thing. Make sure to tie that knot end off. And then take it whenever you got it full up, tie it off the top, and then you just hang that up in the house by the uh, doors, or you can take it, hang it up in the garage, anywhere you've got room, if you have a closet, which is always good for uh, if you'd like to do a lot of vegetable uh, herb drying, take and hang it up in the closet. And that lets you, if you say you need peppers, in my grandfather's case, to make green beans. <coughs> just reach over, grab the string off the bottom, you crumble up, and you just go straight down into the beans, and you're good to go. They're, they're a real simple thing to make. And they look real pretty because peppers are multicolored. You're doing a whole bunch of different types of small peppers. Uh, usually you do this with hot peppers of some sort, not bells, that you can have a really, really interesting bit of decoration in the house. Uh, best vegetables for fall gardening, uh, kale, collards, lettuce, spinach, uh, cauliflower, mustard, endive, carrots, leeks, arugula. Uh, kales, collards, and other cool season are cold crop vegetables. Take the cold really well. They can, you generally handle a lot of frost before they start having issues. Um, sometimes they continue several several weeks after the first frost. Some of them, like I said earlier, they can go through all the way through the winter here because of our weather. Uh, to keep it simple though, we're looking at essentially leaf greens, brassicas, so anything related to broccoli and cauliflower. And then <coughs> the only exception to that being potatoes. There's a few short season potatoes that you can put out that they kind of have a quick little turnaround. The round now is when you want to put those in the ground. You're much better off doing your Irish potatoes and whatnot earlier in the season. Uh, as you can see, there's some radish in a nice little container on the back porch. Good way to keep your uh, salads nice and full throughout the winter. Uh, got some sizes and different examples. Butterhead lettuce. Uh, collard greens. Quit growing. Don't have to worry about hitting them. They usually taste pretty good. Uh, butterhead lettuce, 70 day growing time. All your lettuces will take you cold. Uh, there isn't a one of them that will take a frost or two easily. Uh, mustard, uh, also very tough to the cold. Serves as an excellent way to judge how many bad bugs you have in your garden. Adds a little spice to your salads. Kale is the old workhorse of the garden whenever it comes to the fall and winter gar vegetable gardens. They're tough plants. They'll take cold. They'll take heat. They just keep on going. Uh, it has to be a pretty bad summer or winter to take to kill them out. If you had to give them even just a small amount of protection, they'll just keep going. Uh, leaf salad mixes get sold. A uh, little more little uh, head lettuce. Beets are actually a remarkably great plant. Not only can you eat the root mass, 
there are several varieties that make excellent leaf greens for the first two or three sets of leaves they put on. So you can get multiple uses out of them that way. Uh, hybrid spinach, uh, then there's just good old American and Bloomsdale. Those guys, like we've been talking about, they're super tough plants. Uh, they also grow really fast. That's one of the cool things about the leaf vegetables that I haven't mentioned. Most of them and some of the smaller root crops like radish, we're talking like less than seven days for germination. You can put them in the ground today and they're up showing seedlings within two or three sometimes. They're, they're fast. Winter squash, if you want good winter squash, right now is the time to clean that in the ground. It usually takes them almost three months to set out. So you're kind of cutting it a little bit, but they can also absorb some cold before they have any trouble. So you've got plenty of time still. Uh, Swiss chard is a good one for the cold. They're nice, tough plants. You get them all sorts of different types. The rainbow mixes are my favorite just because they're so pretty. They make eating vegetables look nice. <laughs> Uh, cabbage, carrots, so many different types of carrots, and storage on carrots is really, really simple. Get you a plastic tote, get you a bag or two of sand, take with you a little thin layer of sand in the bottom of the tote, then lay your carrot, cut the tops off the carrots, leave just a little bit of green on them, lay them down in there, gently spritz the entire thing, just a couple of short passes with a water bottle, and then put another thin layer of sand repeat that process till you get to the top of that tote, put the lid on real loose, shove them into a dark spot. And you've got yourself a little homemade root cellar sitting right there. It's a good, quick, easy way to store them if you can actually draw a whole bunch of them. Uh, usually should keep for a month or two. It well, depends on how many carriage you get there. And then that's usually more useful up in like uh, middle of Kentucky and higher. Because around here, you can usually just leave them in the ground throughout most of the winter. Uh, turnip greens, as we talked about, onions, good, tough plants. If you're planting garlic, garlic is you plant in the fall. Uh, always tastes better planting it in the fall, pulling it in the spring. You can split it in the spring, keep what you're going to eat, plant out some stuff to multiply again for your fall planting, where you'll dig them up and then set them out. Uh, if you try doing it the other way around, planting in the spring to harvest in the fall, you wind up with a little extra bitter garlic. It doesn't always taste quite as nice. Uh, pop choy, this is related to broccoli. There's a lot of this stuff that is. Mustard greens are actually related to broccoli. Richard, can you just use the garlic uh, bulbs that you buy to grow the world? Um, you can actually get away with those most of the time. You can uh, take those uh, bulbs and split them and take and plant those out and they'll start growing more garlic. It actually tends to be a very cheap and expensive way to get them because if you try ordering them through catalog, they're sometimes hard to find. They run out really quickly. And that's my alarm telling me that we're almost out of time. <laughs> um, and it can just be hard to kind of manage because some places don't even sell them until now for the fall. Well, one of my favorite uh, providers of seed uh, seedsavers.org, they don't even provide garlic until this time of year. So it, it can be hard to sort of measure that out. Yes, sir. That mustard green, is that the tender green or spinach mustard? Is that all the same stuff? Um, they're all related, just different cultivars. They're all as tough as the next one whenever it comes to the cold, usually. But they're all, you all plant them the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all those seeds are small. Uh, normally when you're planting seeds, I talked earlier about for fall gardening, they're going to put it in the ground twice as deep as they are tall. Uh, generally, depending on how big the seed is, is how deep you want to put it. For normal growing season, like we're planting stuff in the spring, a mustard seed, which is about that tall, you just kind of put on the top of the ground, take your hand and just gently rake back and forth and settle it into the soil, and then walk away. You don't have to put it very deep. You greatly reduce your germination rate whenever you do that. Uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, garlic, leeks, and then this monstrosity. That's a walking stick cabbage. Uh, got a really nice long stem here. Be about seven foot tall, can be up to ten foot. And then all that old stuff's up at the top. Um, Good sources of information, all these sites here. This is all from different uh, agricultural extensions departments. And then some of my
my favorite resources. Uh, Here's a little list of stuff here. Love seed savers. If you're doing uh, fruit trees and shrubs, Stark Brothers is a good place to go to. They've been around since the 1800s. They've got lots of good uh, plant material. They have a really good source on Arkansas black apples if you like apples. Uh, they're one of the few that are actually real resilient to cedar apple rust around here. And then thank you for listening to me. Girl Long for a while.